we say, who is civilization for? And of course, um, I think most people would immediately have an answer. I think most people would say it should uh, benefit human beings. It should sustain the human project. It should benefit the overall uh, biosphere, the ecosystem of the earth, so that this all continues. That's probably who civilization is for, but it's never quite that simple. <clears throat> when I was much younger, I came up with a, an image to help me think about who the beneficiary is of our activities, whether we're engineers or writers or anything else. And I call this the circle of empathy. By the way, the term empathy um, had its origins in the, uh, uh, a circle of psychologists and poets in Germany uh, about a century ago. Um, and the original use of the term was essentially imagining what virtual reality would be like someday. In the original use of the term, uh, there was an example given that somebody might be able to imagine themselves as a leaf or as a mountain, and that as people could exercise their imagination to become different parts of reality, that that would also help them appreciate each other and develop uh, sympathy for one another's different positions. It was a very charming idea, but this notion of a radical transformation of self, wait, God, it's horrible technology. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's always off. I don't know how that happened. Um, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this, this very charming word came from essentially uh, an attempt to imagine what virtual reality would be like someday. And we've always had this idea in virtual reality that maybe if you can imagine yourself in a different position, whether very radical, imaginingly, imagining yourself as a leaf blowing or something, this would help you dislodge yourself from only seeing the world from your perspective all the time. And this might help you become more sympathetic to the situation of others. So the circle of empathy this, this uh, image that I mentioned is the circle around you and anything inside the circle are those who are the beneficiaries of what you do. Anything inside the circle deserves your empathy. Things outside the circle perhaps don't deserve your antagonism, perhaps they don't deserve your um, they don't deserve destruction, but on the other hand, they're not the beneficiaries of what you do. So I would hope that all decent people believe that human beings should be inside the circle. Uh, that's not always the case. There are racists and homophobes and many other varieties of, of uh, ideological people who would like to put some human beings outside of the circle. But I think decent people can agree that humans belong inside. There are some cases that are very difficult to decide. There are controversies about animals. Should animals be inside the circle or on the outside or somewhere right on the edge? In the United States, we have tremendous debates about uh, abortion, about whether uh, an early fetus should instantly be on the inside or not. Typically, liberals wish to make the circle larger and conservatives wish to make the circle smaller. It's a good definition of those two uh, attitudes. Uh, there are problems with making the circle either too large or too small. If you make the circle too small, of course, the problem is you become cruel. In fact, you eventually make it small enough that you even destroy yourself. And this we've seen again and again when conservatism spirals out of control in history, something I don't even need to refer to in this location. Um, 
If you try to make the circle too big, there are also problems. If you say, I will never even kill a bacteria because I wish to support all life, then you, you, you can't live because your body kills bacteria all the time. You essentially become incompetent. And so there's a sort of a zone in which the circle is plausible. Now, I'm telling you about the circle of empathy for a very simple reason, which is that the project of technology, which has existed for centuries, has recently become, I would say, dominated by an idea that we should put machines inside the circle. And this is the idea of artificial intelligence. Now, when I say it's become dominated, I don't think I'm exaggerating. If you talk to most of the people in most of the big tech companies, I'm one of them, but I probably have a minority position on this idea, um, most of them will say, we are in an AI race. Just as was described in your fine introduction, um, where it was said, is Germany going to be in the AI race? <laughs> China announces itself as being in the AI race. Uh, the United States certainly announces itself as being in the AI race. Um, everybody does. It's become this strange myth of competition where everybody is trying to be the inventor and owner and controller and beneficiary of this new life form that we will create. Now, what I wish to propose is that putting a computer inside the circle of empathy, which is um, essentially the idea of artificial intelligence, um, is fundamentally an incompetent idea. Uh, it make, it's very much like trying to not kill bacteria, <laughs> which would force you to never brush your teeth and essentially die. You know, you, couldn't, you can't do it. And in the same way, to treat computers as being alive ultimately is an absurd task that is not what it initially seems to be. And I, I wish to describe my reasons for saying that and some of the reasons that I think there are much better approaches to getting the advantages of new mathematical and engineering techniques that are usually described as AI, but we can get those benefits without the myth-making, without the storytelling, without the theology of AI. Now, um, I call it a theology because within the tech world, artificial intelligence has become very much like a religion. Specifically, it's taken on a quality that is similar to a medieval religion. Uh, the, the adherents are extremely influential. Um, if you're not familiar with this culture, you might think I'm exaggerating, but for instance, Ray Kurzweil, who's the chief engineer of Google, says things that are more extreme <laughs> than what I'm about to say all the time. Um, and so in the new theology, it goes like this. We are building these intelligent machines. They are improving faster than we can, so they will at some point surpass us, just like a jet plane would surpass a race car. And when they surpass us, they will be the most intelligent machines. They will be the dominant life form. It's a religious project. This new, faster machine will inherit the project of life from us. It will take over as the major life form on the planet. Um, those who are close to the machine at that time might have their brains uploaded and achieve in the experience of immortal life within the new giant artificial intelligence. Until then, the first duty of everybody is to share all their data because the data is what will make up the new artificial intelligence. And this is a fascinating point because you might think, why are companies like Google and Facebook so greedy for all this data? 
Can it really possibly make them more money from their advertising to follow your expressions and all these things? Can it really, really do that? And the answer is not really, a little bit. But the, the deep driver is actually this religion. Google says it's only being an advertising company temporarily uh, and it's trying to win the AI race and that's what it's doing with the data. And when I say Google says, I mean the founders and the people who control Google, like Gary, Larry Page, say this very literally. So this is not an inference or a clever restatement. This is simply a report of the literal statement as it is made. So this obviously does bear many similarities to medieval religions. The true believer can get immortality. The non-believer is consigned to death. Uh, there'll be an apocalyptic event that ends everything we know. This is called the singularity when the machines take over. And we're supposed to like that because the machines will be better. They'll be smarter. That is approximately the theology. Now, um, I would like to examine why I think this is a terrible way of thinking from a number of perspectives. Um, but the first one should be obvious because it suggests that people will either all be killed or at the very best be made obsolete. And this is surely a ridiculous way of conceiving of a project that should be about serving humanity, the project being technology. It's, we've inverted our goals where technology is the beneficiary instead of a tool to serve the original population. So this is a tremendously tragic example of the circle of empathy being expanded in an incompetent way, where in order to expand it to include computers, we're actually kicking people out because we're saying that they will not be the beneficiaries after the singularity. But I want to dig a little deeper into the details of this. And I want to use a very specific example that I often find is the easiest way to get across how I see this. So the example I'm going to use is translation between languages, such as between German and English, as is being performed now by someone I can barely see in the soft light of a glass box <laughs> over there. Hello, translator. <laughs> so some of you have probably heard me use this example before, and I apologize for being repetitive, but I think it's clear, so I'll continue to use it. The idea of translating between human languages was one of the first dreams of computer science, even as early as the 1950s. My mentor, the most important mentor for me was named Marvin Minsky. And Marvin Minsky, as you might know, was the person who probably did more than any other person to promote the idea of artificial intelligence, to promote the mythology of it. And I'll get back to that a little bit later, but Marvin loved to argue. So the fact that we disagreed about this from when I was a kid was wonderful. I would tell Marvin, this whole AI thing is just horrible. Why are we doing it? And he would say, it'll be effective for getting our grants, so shut up and just play along. <laughs> and in fact, it was true. It was very good for getting grants. Back in the early days, in the 70s was when I started at this. You would go to a grant-making organization such as the Defense Department, you say, we're gonna build this super smart thing and if we don't do it, our enemies might and it'll get smarter than people. And it's, okay, here's your money, here's your money. Oh my God, you better. And so it was very effective. And it, it actually, the whole thing started off as, as storytelling to get grants. And I, I'm not saying this as a scholar, but as a direct participant. Um, this, is, this, is where, this is where it started. But at any rate, about language translators. One day, Marvin had the idea that maybe computers were good enough that a couple of graduate students could achieve translation between languages over the course of a summer. So he assigned it as a summer project. And the idea was simple. You would start with uh, Noam Chomsky's idea of a core, a logical core of language, and then you would have the dictionary for the two languages, and you would combine these two things together with an algorithm and then you should have a translator. It was a reasonable hypothesis and it absolutely failed. 
And people tried and tried and tried to do more and more sophisticated versions of that approach for decades. Until in the 1990s, some researchers at IBM's lab had a totally different idea. They were saying, you know, trying to write a program that understands language is hopeless, because we, we use language, but we don't understand language. Nobody has a scientific description of how language works. What we'll do instead is we'll use big data. And this was one of the first examples of big data becoming important in this type of application. We'll get a very, very large amount of text that has been translated, and then we'll look for correlations of phrase to phrase, phrase to phrase, and we'll create a mashup of that, and that worked. All of a sudden, there were usable translations coming out. And that is still the core of the technique that we all use today. Now, since that time, free translation services have become available. So as we all know, we can go online and from Google or Microsoft or others, we can enter some text and we'll get a memo translated or a web page. It's wonderful. I think this is a fantastic service. It's convenient. I enjoy it. I benefit from it. However, there's something very strange going on because with these services coming online, the career prospects for people who translate professionally have changed. And to get into how they've changed properly requires a bit of a technical discussion. It used to be that there were 10 times more people who could look to a career in translation and they, their um, success formed a bell curve where most of them fell in the middle once again, it's a little technical. And what happens after something's been regimented under a computer system is it changes to a much smaller number of people and it looks like what we call a zip curve where there are a few people who can benefit from it, but most don't. At any rate, on average what's happened, although there's some people who've done very well, on the whole, there's about a 10th the level of, of a career prospect for somebody who does translation for a living. Uh, because they can't get a job doing those little memos anymore for a business, which used to be a lot of the work. Now, uh, this follows exactly the pattern of other tasks that used to be paid that have been turned free. It's what's happened with recording musicians. It's what's happened with photographers. It's what has happened crucially with investigative journalists. Uh, and so uh, you might say, well, that's very sad, but this is just the old story of progress. When a new technology comes along, it makes some skills obsolete. You might say that, except you'd be wrong. In this case, the reason you're wrong is something that's not widely realized. Every single day, the language changes. Every single day, we need new example phrases. For instance, there's news. We suddenly have to talk about yellow jackets in France, and that has to be translated correctly. If it's translated literally, it will turn into nonsense. We have to talk about new pop culture, new jokes, new songs, new memes, all of these things. And where do we get the example phrases? We steal them. We go around to people who do not understand that we're taking the translations and we simply take them. They have all clicked through on their little agreement that lets us do it and we steal them by the tens of millions every single day. We have, the algorithms have found people who are doing translation for one reason or another. Um, for instance, sometimes it's amateurs who like to do subtitles on the most recent YouTube videos for their language, that sort of thing. Um, so here we have a very screwy, bizarre situation. We're telling the people, you're obsolete because a giant electronic brain is better than you and has replaced you, but we still need you. We're going to steal from you. <laughs> So can you see something wrong with that? So there's a sense in which AI can be understood 
as a new way of packaging data and other efforts, creative efforts between people rather than as a thing in itself. Now, if any AI, and this is a principle that generate, that generalizes, if each AI, each supposed AI program is different, not all of them need new data every day, but they all ultimately come from people. And so in order to treat the AI as alive, you have to somehow hide all those people. You have to tell those people, get behind the curtain like I did before <laughs> when I wasn't sure if I should be on stage. You have to pretend that they aren't there. You have to tell the people, you're not needed anymore. Maybe you'll survive on basic income or something. And so, but the funny thing is that the AIs are always owned by somebody. The AI is owned by Google or maybe Microsoft or somebody, Baidu, if it's a Chinese one. So essentially AI, when I hear AI, I hear the word theft. To paraphrase Lenin, AI is always is theft. It's, it's, a, it's a form of pretending that people didn't contribute when in fact it was crucially about what people contributed. So from a political and economic perspective, it's a disaster. Um, in the past, every time a new technology emerged, we would say this is creative destruction and if some old jobs have gone away because the skills are different now, that's okay because there'll be new jobs. But there can only be new jobs if we accept the idea that the people who do those jobs should be paid. If we say, well, there are new jobs, the new people are needed, however, we're gonna pretend they're not there, we're gonna pretend we're not stealing from them, and we're not gonna pay them, then of course, that system breaks down, and instead you create unemployment as the technology advances, which is a disaster. It means that technology hurts people instead of helps people. So going back to our question, who is technology for? If we say it's in part for machines, if, and when we say artificial intelligence, we're suggesting that the machine itself is becoming the beneficiary, that there's an intrinsic value in making the machine have a certain status. If we say that, we also in the same breath are removing people from having that same status. Um, so it's a remarkably unethical and destructive idea. Now having said that, I want to make very clear that the thing I'm criticizing involves storytelling, myth-making, it involves vocabulary, it involves uh, ethics, it involves economics, but I am not criticizing computer code, I am not computer I'm not criticizing the design of robots. I'm not designing something fundamentally mathematical or in the realm of engineering. I actually happen to love that stuff. Um, the people who do AI and call it AI think I do AI. For instance, my friends and I sold Google their first machine vision company. I do that stuff, but to me, it's just code. To me, there's no reason to add this new layer of myth-making that gives it a kind of a supernatural status as this new life form that we're creating. In fact, there's every reason not to. Let me give you one more approach to this idea. As you probably know, one of the earliest expressions of the idea of AI was from Alan Turing, the principal inventor of the computer and this is called the Turing test. When I was in school, when I was young, we were taught the Turing test as if it were one of Einstein's thought experiments, as this foundational core idea in modernity, and we weren't taught anything about the bi biographical context in which Turing thought of it. We knew very little about it, actually. We, it was just an abstraction. More recently, more and more people are aware a little bit of Turing's biography. There was a major movie about it. It's become part of the public discourse. At the time, nobody knew. Um, so for those of you who don't know, 
Turing proposed the idea of the Turing test in the last weeks of his life. He'd had an extraordinary, extraordinary life. Um, as the, the principal inventor of the computer, he had been drawn into the war effort and uh, plausibly was responsible for saving Britain from an invasion. Um, and what he did with the, one of the earliest computers was he broke a Nazi secret code, which was called the Enigma Code. You all probably know this history, but just in case, the Enigma Code was decoded with a little box, and um, the mathematicians in the Nazi intelligence services believed it to be unbreakable, but they weren't aware that there was a computer on the other side, and the computer could break it. So after the war, Turing was initially celebrated as one of the great heroes uh, of, of Britain. However, it happened that he was gay. And at that time, it was illegal to be a homosexual in Britain. And uh, he, along with about 50,000 others who had participated in the war effort, were um, treated as, uh, not exactly as criminals, but sort of as mental patients. So he was, he was forced to accept a, um, a treatment, a quack, bizarre, um, uh, unscientific and cruel treatment that was supposed to cure his homosexuality. He was forced to accept uh, massive doses of female hormones in, with the idea that that would balance his sexuality. And here we see the extraordinary power of the metaphors we choose to use to understand our own technologies. Um, before the computer became the dominant metaphor, uh, the steam engine had been the dominant metaphor. And during uh, Turing's lifetime, the computer was known to only a few individuals, so the steam engine was still the powerful metaphor. And with steam engines, it's all about balancing pressures. And um, therefore, the popular version of Freudian psychology had to do with balancing these, pre these pressures. So the idea was that, wow, his sexuality must be out of balance, so we're going to balance it with the opposite hormone, and somehow that will get the engine to not be giving off steam and, and, and all that. It's something like that, something crazy, something stupid. So. Um, he uh, developed female bodily characteristics and he committed suicide in an extraordinary way by eating an apple laced with cyanide next to the first computer in his lab. Do you all know this story? Yeah, yeah some of you do. So um, it was just in the, the last weeks before his death that he wrote down the Turing test. And once you understand the context, I don't think it's possible to read it in the same way. So the usual way that the Turing test is told is we're told that uh, Turing uh, tr modified a, an older parlor game in which a, a judge was supposed to determine whether little t slips of text that are transmitted under a screen were coming from a man or a woman. He'd have to guess who was the man, who was the woman. They both might be trying to deceive the judge and I don't know why this was considered an entertaining game. I, th I find it, it sounds kind of boring to me. I don't get it, but anyway, apparently Victorians thought that this was incredibly amusing. Um, and so Turing said, well, get rid of the woman and let's have a person and a computer. And if the judge can't distinguish them, what distinction is there? Okay, now this is a very interesting intellectual move. It's a very interesting one because it doesn't say anything about the absolute status of anybody. It doesn't say, all it says is if you think people are elevated in some way and you can't distinguish the person from the machine, who are you to discriminate against the machine? So it essentially puts the machine into the role of the homosexual or the Jew or some other oppressed class takes the machine into the circle of empathy and complains, why does this thing not have status? Why does it not have rights? However, however, and, th and that's the attitude that the tech world has had ever since. The, 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 um, 
technical young men will often whine, why isn't my machine treated as a real person? But you're, you know, my machine's smarter than your dog. I don't know, I run into this all the time in the lab with brilliant young men. So, um, the thing is, Turing was being tortured to death for his identity. And I think the way we should read this should be informed by the context. I think it was in part a very dark cry of pain. It was saying, here, what more could I have done for Britain? What more could I have done for the cause of civilization? What more could I have done for the cause of democracy than what I did? And yet I'm still being killed for who I am. And I think there's an indictment built into it. There's an indictment that, you know, if you can't treat me as a person, I guess maybe you'll treat a computer as a person. It's bringing up the whole absurdity of the lack of empathy shown towards him. Um, I think that that's the better interpretation given the context. I think what he's saying is that if you have so little humanity, I bet you can't tell a computer from a person. And in fact, if you look, if you look in the footnotes, he only, wrote, he only wrote two versions of it, one in a little note and another is, is part of a little article. And if you look in the footnotes, he has a comment, surely you can see that ultimately the computer came from people and people came from God and whatever you see in the computer is ultimately just part of the divinity you see in people. He has this amazing footnote which nobody ever reports on. Okay, so, um, I want to say something else about the Turing test, which is a little bit of a joke, a, a little bit tongue in cheek, but here's what I wish to point out. In the, the Turing test as it's, as it's usually presented, there's a judge who's attempting to distinguish a person from a computer only getting uh, little um, notes, little tweets, you might say, little, little, little messages. Now, the assumption of the, of the technically minded nerd is that if the judge can't distinguish which is the computer and which is the person, it must mean that the computer has become elevated and has become like a person. But there's another logical possibility, which is that the person has gone down. The person might have made themselves debased. The person might have made themselves stupid. And that is why you cannot dis distinguish them from the computer. It's another logical possibility. There's nothing in the Turing test that tells us which happened. Furthermore, the judge might have become stupid. Okay, so you start with two people in one computer. Either the computer might become elevated or the people might become stupid. But because they're two people, I would argue that there's a two thirds chance that a person became stupid rather than a machine became smart. Okay, so in general, any time the Turing test seems to be passed, it probably means that people have gotten stupid. Now, you might say, well, this is just a theoretical exercise, but that you would be wrong. This is actually possibly the most important um, technological interaction going on now because it has, it's creating an existential threat to our species and our civilization. Now, here's what I refer to. I'm referring to fake people that create fake social perception that destroy human character, destroy the politics of a region, and ultimately destroy the ability of mankind to act in any collective way that's rational. So let me um, say, let me un unpack those things. Um, humans have a characteristic that we share with many other species that we perceive socially. And what I mean by that um, is that the way people around you are directing their attention and the attitude they have to the world forms a collective perception net that all, of, all people present are aware of. We're always helping each other watch for dangers. We're always helping each other be aware of opportunities. In one of my books, I tell the story of when I was a boy, I and some friends would play this trick where we would go out into a crowd and start pointing at something when there's nothing there and soon everybody was looking there. That is social perception. So 
In the online world right now, the rate at which fake accounts are added to platforms like Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, or um, accounts on uh, YouTube, Google accounts, uh, the rate of of fake people is rising faster than the ability of the companies to purge the fake people. So we have an unknown but large portion of fake people. And the fake people, uh, there's a whole economy. You can buy bulks of fake people if you want to suddenly buy a followers so that you look popular. You can buy the service of creating many fake people to have a political idea. You can do all of this. Now, this is one of the things, <laughs> because of my concerns about AI, I started writing about the danger of this very early, and I even have an essay from the early 90s uh, about the possibility of fake people who in those, case, in those days we called agents, and today they'd be called bots, but about the possibility of them swaying elections through false social perception and how they might go into battle with each other. Uh, and I wasn't the only one. I think other, there were other people also writing about this danger. All of our warnings were useless, obviously, because it's exactly what's happened. So when fake people are created and they throw an election, what's happening is that the Turing test has been won by people getting stupid. Can you see that it's the same as in my analysis of, that, of the old thought experiment? Essentially what we've proven is that we're willing to become stupid in order to make the machines seem intelligent, in order to let them influence us. But ultimately, and this must be remembered, there is no weird alien or angel or supernatural force that's creating computer programs. It's all from people. And so therefore, if there is an AI that's making people stupid, that AI is being run by somebody. And whoever that somebody is, is seeking their own agenda, which is typically money or power, or occasionally um, just a kind of nihilism. But usually it's money or power, or it's maybe an ego thrill. Whatever the motivation, whenever people are made stupid by believing in AI, there's somebody unrevealed, somebody behind the, the, the curtain, who's the beneficiary, who's the puppet master. Um, these days, we tend to think of that person as being Vladimir Putin because he's been caught doing it so much. And there's such extremely um, well-done documentation of him having done it in some specific cases, such as in the US election, um, in the Brexit vote, and so on. Uh, I'm certain that there are actually many people who do it. It's very inexpensive to do. It's easy to do. Um, in fact, <laughs> there was this experiment we did at Microsoft that I interpret perhaps in a different way than the experimenters. Uh, what we, we made a little chat bot, and the idea is that it would talk to a large number of people, millions of people at once, and use their phrases with each other through pattern matching to create the illusion that it was a friend you could talk to. So there were all these people talking to each other without realizing it. They all thought that they were talking to an AI. It was called Tay. And uh, within 24 hours, it turned into a Nazi. It became this horrible, racist, evil thing. It had to be shut down. And so the question is, why? And there are two popular explanations for this. One of them is that there was just a group of kids who were being vandals and kept on feeding it ugly things. But I have a different interpretation, and it's very hard to show which one is more correct. I think we created a Putin detector. I think what happened is our bot started interacting with other bots that were, mal that were malicious, and they had a corrupting effect. So in other words, we made ourselves stupid to believe in this stupid bot. And maybe the right thing is just not to even believe in bots in the first place. Now, a key idea is that any core capability that you can offer using the artificial intelligence framework can also be offered in a different way in which the person perceives themselves correctly as being in control and perceives the value that they receive correctly as having come from other human beings. For instance, right now, um, 
Google somewhat pressures you to just let it choose videos for you, video after video after video. The way it chooses videos is in part based on similarity of interest to what you've selected, but it's also in part driven to get you engaged. And unfortunately, the most engaging material is that material which excites the fight or flight responses within people, such as fear and anger. And so, as has been repeatedly documented by researchers, if you do let the, the Google video search go on, in a remarkable, there's a debate about whether it's a majority or a large minority of cases, but it doesn't really matter. If you just let it choose for you, it eventually will go into some kind of weird, malicious, um, paranoia-inducing, anxiety-inducing zone of videos that seem to have come from malicious sources. And this is not because anybody at YouTube wants to hurt the world. It's simply the natural outcome of this whole methodology. This is what will happen. Uh, the alternative is very simple, which is to say, we will not automatically choose videos for you. You will search for videos and click on them. I mean, the difference is so slight. It's so slight. And there already are some options where you can collect on a, you can click on a collection of videos or something. I mean, there's ways to avoid this, but there's like the artificial intelligence religion makes engineers just loathe, loathe giving people control because they want everybody to buy in to this AI religion. They want people to say, yes, the machine is choosing for me. I trust the machine. The machine is becoming alive. They want that so much that they'll make the world, they'll destroy the world to get that feeling. Uh, and this is, <laughs> uh, so this is something I battle against all the time. I battle against this constantly. And it's difficult. I can attempt to theorize why this holds so much sway in the technical community. Why is tech culture so obsessed? with this idea of creating fake people and of believing that it's creating a new life form? Well, one theory is that it's mostly men and it's some sort of a womb envy kind of a thing that we want to give life. It's a way of not needing women anymore. We can propagate life without them, without, without their difference from us, without their whatever is imagined. Um, the vast majority of people who think this way are men, and the vast majority of influential people in tech society are men, and that is a real factor. It's a very peculiar feeling. That's what part of it. Part of it is it's an effective plot for science fiction, and so much compelling science fiction has been made out of the idea of computers coming alive we could mention the Matrix movies and the Terminator movies and on and on and on. That's had a, a big, big role. And if you look at these movies and you think, wow, science fiction does kind of say something about the future of technology, then what you think to yourself is AI is power in the future. So we better be the ones to make AI first and it better be our AI. Once again, this sense of the race, this all or nothing race where nothing else matters. Um, within the tech community, you'll often hear, and by the tech community, I mean the very most powerful, wealthy, and influential individuals, my friends, <laughs> in many cases, you'll often hear an argument like, well, it's fine for you to worry about global warming. It's fine for you to worry about whether there'll be enough fresh water when we hit peak population later in the century. It's fine for you to worry about the danger of emerging new infectious diseases as populations travel around the world. You can worry about all that stuff, but it doesn't really matter. The only thing that really matters is the AI race because the AI will be smart enough to solve all those things. So everything else is a waste of time. It's the singular focus on this fetish object. You can say it's a little bit like the golden calf in the Old Testament of a sort of a flowering of vanity of people believing that they can be God, which is, an, I think, a natural thing to want. It's difficult to be a person 
we die. Mortality is very difficult. And this gives you a fantasy of some other status, some other story. Um, that's a very big part of it. Another part of it is what I call nerd imperialism. <laughs> and what that means is that the nerd mentality, the nerd mindset would like to subsume all the other ones. So all the people who are interested in art or design, all the people who are interested in sociology, the people who are interested in politics, the people who are interested in psychology, the people who live subjectively and are interested in the impressions of the world, the people who believe in interiority and are interested in their own experience, they would, the nerd imperialist would like to overwhelm and control and be superior to all of these. And it's kind of happened because we make so much money. We make, you know, the biggest companies are tech companies now, and they've come up very quickly. We're outpacing even the pharmaceuticals. We're kind of kings in a way. And so um, when somebody has that kind of good fortune, they always read it as confirmation of their high self-regard. And so naturally we think, yes, this whole business of replacing people with something we invent, of course it makes sense. And people are paying us to do it because of course it is the right thing. <coughs> but ultimately, the deepest reason that I think we should reframe the mathematics and the engineering that's normally bundled kind of arbitrarily as being the thing that is AI, the reason I think we should reframe that instead as simply technology that people use instead of a life form is a spiritual reason. I find that each moment is remarkable. I am absolutely astonished that I'm experiencing this. I'm absolutely astonished that I'm not a machine. There's this extra thing where I am alive inside this body. I am perceiving this is, can be called consciousness. It can be called experience. It can be called sentience. Whatever you call it, the AI people will say, oh no, that's something we can do with the program. They'll subsume it. So no vocabulary is adequate to describe it, which is maybe appropriate. But this amazing sense that there's something manifestly supernatural in every moment of ordinary life, this thing to me is sacred and absolutely remarkable. It makes me a better scientist it makes me a better technologist because it reminds me that I don't understand everything. It reminds me that I live only on a little speck of understanding in a sea of mystery. It reminds me of how precious and mysterious other people are, even though I can only go by faith that they're also experiencing. It reminds me of how Life is magical, how much gratitude I have to be here. And the loss of that, the loss of that to this AI fantasy of power and greed and ideological empiricism is such a horrible idea. It's such a loss. I think that one of the, there are many things going on in the world um, social media is exciting these emotions through fake people and it's making politics horrible everywhere. Um, there's been this incredible concentration of wealth and power, much of it be for the people who are closest to the big computers in one way or another. There are many things going on that are destabilizing and harming the world, but I think one of them is this looming sense of people becoming obsolete. I was recently giving a talk to high school students in the US and I heard questions I've never heard before. I heard questions of the form, well, if we're gonna be obsolete, why did our parents have us? What is the point? I've never heard that from a young person before. I've heard young people who are scared or angry. I've heard all kinds of things. I've heard young people who think adults are full of crap, all of those things, but I've never heard that. 
And I think this sense that the technologists are about to make people obsolete is having a deleterious effect on the world along with all the other things. I think it's part of the reason why we see such a rise in fundamentalist religions of all kinds everywhere. Whether we're talking about India, um, the Islamic world, um, Israel, the United States with fundamental Christianity, all over the world you see the rise of these things and I think it's in reaction to this idea of like, wow, people are about to be obsolete. And it's those other nerds over there who are owning the new God, not us. That's a horrible feeling. It's based on a lie. It's a lie we shouldn't be telling. Um, that is my talk for now. And <laughs> we will. <laughs>
and more children would have been dying from lung cancer. And we, we finally came to a decision as a society that having cigarette smoke everywhere was actually not worth it. But it was very hard. At first, everybody resisted. Everybody said, no, 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 I feel sexy when I smoke. I feel it's my personal right. They were all, you know, there, there was a very different feeling. And it, we could not have made that progress if there weren't at least a few people who were outside of the addiction. And it's the same with this. If there are at least some people who start to see their own role in perpetuating the system, that might be enough, even a small number, to change the conversation. Uh, so that's the individual responsibility. As far as government, um, this is what we've been talking about for the last two days. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a big topic. Um, I think that government has to evolve its sense of regulation in, in such a way as to attack the problems in the very f most fundamental ways possible. So for instance, in Europe, there's been an emphasis on privacy, GDPR and so on. But the privacy violation in itself is not the thing that does damage. It's what's done with the information after privacy is violated. Um, so you can have an excellent label on a bottle of water and it can say, you can say, wow, in the fine print, it says this is poison. But really, you shouldn't be allowed to put poison in the bottle. <laughs> and so I, I think that we have to go many steps beyond the GDPR so that it's not just about preventing privacy violation, but preventing manipulation. And I think the only way to do that really has to do with restricting not just how data is gathered, but how it's used, and ultimately, trying to get rid of the uh, business model of manipulation, which, um, uh, and in, indeed, probably the metaphor of artificial intelligence in the long term. Um, and uh, there are many schools of thought about how to do that, but I think regulation has to cut as deep as possible because the tech companies are very clever and wiggly. If you look at how we evade taxes, for instance, I shouldn't say that, except for Microsoft, only the other ones. But if you look at how clever these things are, it gives you a sense of how clever people with big computers can be. And so it's very, very hard to foresee what will happen from a regulatory point of view. You have to cut very, very deep. This is the kern of datenmissbrauchs den Sie ja vorhin beschrieben haben. Was ist der Kern des Datenmissbrauchs? Sie hatten ja vorhin beschrieben, die Ermöglichung auch des Missbrauchs durch Dritte und hatten dann davon gesprochen, künstliche Intelligenz, wie sie heute verwendet wird, besteht oft aus dem Diebstahl geistigen Eigentums, Diebstahl von Daten, Missbrauch von Daten. Jetzt gibt es ja andere Bereiche der Politik, wo versucht wird, so etwas zu regulieren. Also zum Beispiel bei der Frage, von genetischer Vielfalt ist mit dem Cartagena-Protokoll und anderen versucht worden zu sagen, die Regionen, in denen so etwas entstanden ist, die müssen einen Anteil haben, wenn diese Informationen genutzt werden. Sie Plädoyer, haben ja ein Plädoyer auch schon abgegeben dafür, dass Daten einen Wert bekommen müssen, dass insgesamt Abstand genommen werden muss von einer Alles-umsonst-Kultur und dass die Nutzung von, ja, zum Beispiel einer solchen Übersetzung äh, verwendet wird. Wie, wie soll man sich das in der Praxis vorstellen? Ist dann der Schreiber eines Textes, muss den Menschen die Idee bezahlen, die er in seinem Roman verwendet hat? Das Übersetzungsprogramm muss dafür bezahlen, dass es äh, Subtitles auf YouTube eingesammelt hat. Wie, was ist der Kern dieser Idee? Okay, so... Um I think there are um, maybe two questions within that question, and if it's okay, I'd, actually there's like 12 questions, but I'd like to answer two of them in order. One of them, you, was, you were asking about the variety of abuses of data, and I'd like to just give you one other example of an abuse before I get to the specifics of translation, if that's okay. Uh, the United States has an insane system of healthcare uh, where it's privatized, and you get your health care mostly through your employer, and if you're freelance, you're at risk. Um, this is a crazy system, but anyway, it's what we have. Now, uh, 
before big computers, before big cloud computers, before the algorithms that we call AI algorithms, the competitive pattern between insurance companies was to get as many people signed up as possible because that created a bigger pool. So it was all about scale. And the bigger the insurance company, the more profitable in absolute terms. As soon as the big computer showed up, the business incentives for insurance companies completely reversed. Now you had software that could correlate the lives of millions and tens of millions of people. And so you had better predictions of what would happen to somebody. And now your goal was to insure as few people as possible, those who are unlikely to make a claim. Right? And so all of a sudden it became about dropping people and reducing the number of people. So people were served, more information resulted in poor service instead of better service. It had exactly the opposite effect of what you might want. Um, so I'm, and uh, the same thing has happened in many other instances in industry where the use of these algorithms has undone previous assumptions because it gives one, whoever's closer to the bigger computer enough extra information, enough e extra insight to essentially undo what might otherwise seem to be a normal business. Um, so now keep that in mind, and now I'll address your second question, which is in the case of the language transla translators, how would it work exactly? Now, um, as we all know, people have more capability technologically than we used to. Technology has improved, let's say, since 100 years ago. Um, we would like to hope that our societies are getting somewhat better organized as well. And if you combine those things, what you see is a growing economy. So we see the economy grow. And as the economy grows, hypothetically, it should benefit everyone, which would mean that everyone is gaining benefits from our improved technologies and our improved abilities to coordinate. So I think I'm saying something that's very, very basic. Now, in the case of the insurance company, I showed an exception where that is uh, broken. It's a, a market failure, if you like, where people are suffering as we, the technology improves for the benefit of a small few instead of everybody benefiting, right? Now, what I would argue is that in the future, let us suppose that you start paying for things like translations, you start paying for things like Facebook, and, and let me just deal with one question. I know you might say, oh, I would never pay for that, even though I'm addicted to it. Um, but the thing is, people pay for Netflix. Like, once people get used to paying for something, not only does it become acceptable, but they often perceive what they've paid for as being the best thing ever. People perceive Netflix as, as having improved the quality of television. I don't know how important Netflix is in Germany, actually. Is that a good example here? Yeah, OK. So. Um, the thing is, though, that if we believe that this technology is improving our abilities, then the amount that people are paid for data should always be ahead of how much they have to pay for the services made of their data. In other words, um, if you are working in a car factory, you should make enough money to be ahead of the game at the end of the month. You shouldn't become poorer and poorer you should do better and better because you're helping provide cars. In the same way, the price paid for data has to be high enough that it's becoming a new industry that people take pride in, that they find sustenance in. So the degree to which you're paid has to outpace the degree to which you pay, ultimately, on average. And um, you might ask, can that economics work out? We're so used to the idea that everything on the internet should be free and the companies make billions upon billions of dollars, but otherwise nothing's worth anything. We're so used to this bizarre prejudice that we can't even imagine that a different economics could also work out. But in fact, it can. And it's one of the reasons why I've started collaborating with economists. This could be a completely sensible, sustainable economy that I think would, would result in a better world. Um, there are many details that could vary. Do you pay a subscription or do you pay little micropayments with use? Um, one thing that I feel would be a crucial element is people who provide data have to be able to bargain collectively. It can't be each person against each other person. 
The big tech companies would like it to be each person against each other person, so the prices are driven down to nothing. But in fact, both in the real world and online, people have to bargain collectively in order to be paid. And so there has to be some new concept of a data union or, or something. And um, I actually, this leads to many thoughts, but um, I'll, I'll just share one of them. Um, right now, we frequently petition the big tech companies like uh, Facebook or Google to become the government globally, the arbiter for speech and indeed even for action. We'll say, we must, you are responsible for stopping the hate speech. You must stop the harassment. You should stop the, the um, fake news and all of, all of these things, right? But the problem is every time we get them to do that, we also cement their power. We're declaring them to be the ultimate controllers of culture, step by step by step. And I don't think that that ends in a good place. I think that some sort of new collective bargaining uh, entity that would assure that people are paid well for their data could also become a new uh, element of civil society. It could become like a medieval guild where you would say if you hire somebody who's good at uh, stone cutting or something who's part of this guild, you're also getting quality. They enforce their own quality. That these, these entities could also become the aspects of society that become entrusted with providing truth and quality and, and decency in the future. This is a more complex idea, and I'm only presenting the barest picture of it, but there has to be some way that there's a center of influence online other than the central hub that is able to create quality so everything doesn't turn to garbage. Because, of course, if there's only one source, it does turn to garbage. And, uh, uh, and so this idea that the data union could be the same thing as the source of quality is called uh, a mid, creating a mid. And those who are interested can find an article I recently wrote with a colleague in the Harvard Business Review that describes them. Um, but uh, um, so there, once you start going down this path of reimagining technology as if people were the purpose, you end up inventing all of these ideas. Um, but in a way, it's a very easy and natural invention. And I, I believe that even though some of these ideas might sound a little radical or bizarre, in fact, they're not. They're very gentle and more similar to things that have worked for humanity in the past. Wäre das auch ein Lösungsmodell? Ja, yeah. I'm sorry. No. Um, wäre das auch ein Lösungsmodell für die Bereiche, die wir heute ja Plattformkapitalismus nennen, die jetzt ja sehr beteiligt sind an diesem Rennen um Lösungen der künstlichen Intelligenz und wo man auch das Gefühl hat, auch das ist ja eine Art von Diebstahl, also die Ubers, die dann die ähm, Standards für die eingesetzten Fahrzeuge senken, die die Leute eigentlich in eine Auktion um ihre Dienstleistung zwingen, der Amazon Marketplace, der kleinen Händlern die Aufgabe überlässt, ein Produkt in den Markt einzuführen und wenn sie erfolgreich sind, nimmt er es weg und mit seiner ganzen Marketing-Power übernimmt er dann die den Verkauf, ähm, könnte man auch diese kleinen, diese Freelancer, äh, die kleinen Firmen mit einem solchen Modell unterstützen und damit auch hier für eine Stabilisierung und einen wirtschaftlichen Fortschritt für alle sorgen? Ja, yeah, so this is interesting. Um, now, of course, the complaint of... Um, um, a sort of a gilded age with excessive um, income inequality and excessive control of vital resources is not new. This is something um, that has been a problem for a long time and identified as one from long before there were computers. We could mention Karl Marx as someone who was eloquent on this topic, uh, very, very good critic, terrible inventor, but good critic. Uh, and. Uh, so part of this problem is old, and then part of it is new. And the part of it that is old is familiar, so I won't go over it. The part of it that is new is the special benefits that someone gets by being close to one of the biggest computers. So as I was mentioning before, uh, with the example of insurance in the United States, 
if you are close to one of the big computers, you do have an information advantage, and information is power. Now, interestingly, Silicon Valley didn't realize this at first. The first people to realize it were investors on Wall Street who used it for automated training, automated training, trading, causing the first computer-driven flash crash in the late 80s, very early. Um, and the people using algorithms for automated trading for a little while made these easy fortunes because they could outguess everybody. And then everybody got them and they balanced out and now it doesn't work anymore. Um, it's just, so they've, but it, I think it did do damage to the market. And um, that's another very interesting story to tell. But I think some of the investment groups that had initially gotten an advantage from using bigger computers um, were, essential, were motivated to become more traditional monopolists and create kind of cartels among themselves to create the illusion that they were still benefiting even though it was no longer about the computer once they had canceled each other out. So it's a bit of a complicated history. The next party to figure this out was a company called Walmart. And Walmart used a big computer to, to correlate information about their supply chain so that they could out-negotiate everybody who was a supplier and concentrate capital for, the, for themselves more so than previous um, hubs. And that worked for a while. Amazon came along and said, wait, we're not just going to do this to the supply, we're gonna do this to the demand too. We're gonna do it to the people as well as to the suppliers. We're gonna do the whole loop. And so then they overwhelmed Walmart. And um, I, uh, uh, one of my, one of the crucial things for the future is to undo certain kinds of um, unsustainable and, and unsupportable advantages that people gain from big computers if they own those big computers. And having to pay for the data would seem to be an obvious way to do it. If Amazon has to pay for the data that gives it an advantage, there'll be an equilibrium reached where the benefits of the computer will start to be spread widely instead of concentrated. Ich, ich weiß ja nicht, wie es Ihnen geht. Mir macht natürlich unglaublich Spaß, mit jemand über die strukturellen Probleme von Technologie, die gelöst und gerichtet werden sollen, zu sprechen, <lacht> der selber ein Techie ist und nicht schon mal mit einer äh, grundsätzlichen ähm, Skepsis überhaupt an Veränderungen seit dem Farbfernsehen ähm, beginnt, sondern wirklich über das zu sprechen, ähm, was läuft gut, was läuft schlecht und wie verbessern wir das, ähm, was schlecht läuft. Aber deswegen die Frage, wo hat dieses ähm, auch Schieflaufen begonnen? Ist es Technologie immanent, also bei den Techies, als sie glaubten, sie müssen jetzt andere Formen von Code einführen? Oder waren das dann erst die CFOs und die Investoren, die die Technologie für bestimmte Marktmodelle eingesetzt haben? Uh, yes. Well, uh, the sociology of how we got to where we are is interesting. And I've tried to capture a little bit of it in the new book, The Dawn of the New Everything. Um, Part of the problem uh, arose because um, at the dawn of networking, which was in the uh, 70s and 80s, before the internet, um, a lot of the young men with technical educations were um, thought that the most important feature of civilization was an ability to hide from the government. In the United States, this was driven largely by the Vietnam War, where there'd been a very widespread experience of being drafted into the army and then being sent to a war that was not really supported and was very uh, horribly brutal. And so the, a lot of young men of, the, of that era still had embedded in them very deeply this idea that the number one, the number one by far, thing that one has to be able to achieve is to hide from the government, and the government is always the bad thing. Um, and often the government is, but it's not the only thing, though. And so they had, there was, it was out of balance. 
As for the part, the aspect of America, the other side of America that was more, uh, what we say, conservative or pro-war, um, they had a different problem, which, which is that they were getting arrested all the time for driving too fast. Uh, President uh, Jimmy Carter had imposed a speed limit in the 70s to conserve gas. It's a little bit like the Yellow Jacket protests in Paris, I suppose. And um, all these people are saying, well, we're not going to drive slow. We're Americans. <laughs> we're going to drive fast. Then they get arrested. And so they developed a technology which was called CB radios, where everybody would take on a fake persona, just like on on the internet today, and they would warn each other where the police were. And so once again, the idea of technology to hide from the government was very central. So the whole thing was born with this idea that you have to hide, 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 and the government's bad, 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 and it's all about individuals. It was this very cowboy, Wild West idea. Um, and then that was moving forward, and then there was another wave of... Um, I would say hippie socialism, that everything should be free. On the internet, we will never pay for anything. Everything will be this giant sharing. It'll be like a commune. But then there was this other thing, which is we love the entrepreneurs. We worship the, the, the big, like a Steve Jobs, like entrepreneurs. We worship these people. Um, they were considered to have a, uh, oh, it's Germany. They, they had a Nietzschean uh, elevation. They were uh, these supermen who uh, could dent the universe and had, had some kind of creative will that could change things. And so you have this weird thing. You're hiding from the government. You want to be a hippie communist. And you want to support entrepreneurs. How do you combine these things together? And so we ended up making a lot of terrible decisions because there were very few decisions available that could actually um, address all of these different ideas. So, for instance, the internet as it was born doesn't represent people. You don't have accounts on it. That had to come from private companies because the idea is that, oh, my God, if you tell the internet who you are, then the government can find you. So, but it's absurd because all we, we just created these gigantic companies to cover these holes, like Facebook, you know, to have an account. It's just, it, it truly was a self-defeating, ridiculous idea, but this feeling was very strong. And then this idea, everything must be free, but we still want entrepreneurs. How can you achieve that? Oh, instead of two people paying to do whatever they do, they'll experience things being free. They'll be told to share. They'll be told to be open, they'll be told they're in a commune. But actually, the only way it's financed is there's a third party who's paying out of a belief that they can be manipulated. Which is also just the stupidest thing ever, but that's what we were left with. So we started with these absolutely unassailable ideologies and passions, and by being inflexible, we forced ourselves into a little tiny space of possible solutions, which is exactly the world we have. Ich würde gerne, äh, letzte Frage, ähm, okay. ich fand das sehr überzeugend, auch die Darstellung, warum muss, darf man sich eigentlich an diesen Manipulationsmaschinen nicht beteiligen, bis sie ihr ähm, Geschäftsmodell verändert haben, was muss reguliert werden und ich darf das hier erzählen, ich habe ihr Buch äh, Zehn gute Gründe, warum du deinen Social Media Account sofort löschen wolltest, hatte ich als ähm, Lektüre bei einer Dienstreise nach Äthiopien dabei. Ich werde auch im Dezember meinen Facebook-Account noch löschen, aus anderen Gründen. Aber ich fühle mich bestärkt durch das Buch. Und an meinem letzten Tag bin ich einem jungen Studenten begegnet in Lalibela in Äthiopien, der von dieser Aufbruchstimmung mit dem neuen Premierminister berichtete und dann, ohne dass ich ihn darauf ansprechen konnte, sagt, wir brauchen Facebook und Twitter wie die Luft zum Atmen. Und ich hatte gerade am Vortag gelesen, wie schnell die, die damit begonnen hatten, ihre Revolution eigentlich aufgefressen wurden von dieser systematischen Maschine dahinter, die missbrauchte. Was antworte ich an solchen jungen Menschen? Was ist sein Weg, sich zu organisieren, sich mit anderen auszutauschen, ohne in diese Falle zu tappen? Um, Africa has the world's vastest reserve of young people. And young people are precious. And the p people in, uh, was it Ethiopia or Eritrea? Ethiopia. Um, for them to say, we need Facebook, 
is not the right answer. They should be writing their own Facebook. I mean, they have to create their own media. You can't empower yourself on somebody else's power platform, ultimately. You know, this is a, um, ultim you know, uh, this is, <laughs> This is a very upsetting thing to me. So when the Arab Spring happened in Silicon Valley, there was a lot of um, self-congratulations. People were saying, oh, it's the Twitter revolution, it's the Facebook revolution. And I was antagonistic towards this, and it was hard to be because it was like this religious rapturous moment. See, we're saving the world. And I was like, well, Twitter is not gonna create jobs for these kids in Tahrir Square in Cairo. They're, 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 at the end of this, what is, what is there for them? You know, and but there's a deeper problem, and this is a process. the The algorithms that are driving engagement that 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 get more and more data and all of this, what they're looking for is something that they can feed a person that'll get that person to become more and more engaged. And typically, the easiest, the, it's not the only way, but the easiest way that that can happen is if the, if the person is fed something that makes them angry or scared, because those are the emotions that rise the fastest and the easiest and then stick around. And so let's say that you have something like the Arab Spring or in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement. Would, have you heard of that here? Yeah. And so the people who are participating are often young, they're often extremely good-natured, and they're putting all of this stuff out there to communicate with each other, to coordinate. The algorithm doesn't care about them. The algorithm is only looking at how it can get an emotional reaction to get engagement from somebody, from anybody. So naturally, all of this data becomes fuel in exciting and engaging the people who hate them the most. And then the algorithm gets more engagement and more response from the people who are upset and then it introduces those people to each other and drives them more and more and more. So you end up with a tool that, while it was powerful for the Arabs, th what the Arab Spring kids got out of Twitter and Facebook was authentic, but what ISIS is getting is even more, is even more intense. Black Lives Matter was authentic, and it relied on social media, but the revival of the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis in the United States was more intense. And so the thing is that using the system for social change is inherently absurd. It will always have a negative effect later. The initial effect will feel very good and might be quite authentic. So what I would counsel bright kids in Ethiopia is somehow against all odds, write your own damn software first, figure it out. Like don't, don't rely on somebody from another country to provide you with your way of talking to each other. Africa has to develop its own technical culture to a much greater degree than it has. It has to have more technical universities. It has to have more scientific training if this huge generation of young people is going to find success and happiness. It's absolutely urgent. Um, and uh, so don't, don't treat yourself as a consumer of your own, your very language can't be somebody else's product. All right, so that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is, uh, beware of this um, boomerang effect where your good intentions turn into larger bad intentions just in order to serve the addiction machine of some stupid company. Um, so this is going to be a hard message. They might not accept it, but I think it reflects reality. Jérôme Lanier. Yeah. <laughs> Lanier. <laughs>